Fire units stand by. Firing starts. Preliminary stage on. The main stage on. Lift off. On October 4th, 1957, at 10.28 p.m. Moscow time, the successful launch happened. Exactly 295 seconds later, both the satellite and the rocket's 5.5-ton central unit were placed into the elliptic orbit, which is the most distant point from Earth in its apogee, that is 947 kilometers, and the nearest spot in its perigee, that is 288 kilometers. The satellite separation took place 319 seconds after the start, and then the satellite started signaling. Soon, thousands of radio stations around the world started getting unusual signals from space. At the same time, a small moving star appeared in the sky. It was the first time in human history that an object made by man managed to overcome the force of gravity. That radio signal symbolized the beginning of a new era, the space era. We are transmitting an important message from TASS. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union successfully launched the world's first artificial Earth satellite. That was exactly what I had the honor to say then on air to our not-so-crowded television audience when I had been working only for a week as a news anchor. Those times were harsh. The Cold War was just about to start. That was also the time when a designer of Soviet rockets, Sergei Korolev, started working on the project of his lifetime. It was the construction of the R-7 missile, which was destined to become the core of the Soviet agenda of peaceful space exploration. However, the talk back then focused on a new war. In the complicated terms of the current political situation, that was not just about building new engines, and it wasn't only about building rocket engines also, it was about building politics. The rockets were considered only for the nuclear weapons. That was why the research conducted by the designer Mikhail Tikhonorov, who calculated the possibility to create and put into orbit an artificial Earth satellite, was ignored. It was Korolev who took those for granted. Everyone was mocking him. They thought he was just a dreamer. But Sergei Korolev didn't think so. He was totally fine with these ideas right from the start. It was 1947 when Sergei Korolev raised the question of creating rockets for scientific purposes at a meeting with Stalin. So Stalin decided, fine, you're creating the R2 rocket and designing the R3. Forget about the rest. In May of 1954, Stalin's death triggered changes, so Korolev sent a memo post regarding an artificial Earth satellite to the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. But the answer didn't change. They didn't care much for scientific matters in the Kremlin. But it all changed in July 1955. U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower said, the United States is planning to launch the first artificial moon in two years. This is how Americans named their satellite. The message from abroad was taken as a challenge. And so on August 30th of 1955, the Special Committee for the Soviet Earth Satellite Program Development was set up. Why? Because that information from abroad proved there were people sleepless and restless to be the first to do something. Everyone realized back then the importance of pioneering that area. So Korolev immediately started working on his project. The satellite was planned to weigh one and a half tons, and the technical equipment was calculated to weigh from 200 to 300 kilos. You need to think first about the appropriate usage of a rocket. Not only as a missile to destroy something. But also as a means of fulfilling the dream of space traveling. There is a satellite on the ISS that we are planning to launch during a spacewalk. We do these launches from time to time to better perform scientific tasks. The size of such a satellite might be compared to the first artificial Earth satellite. Its diameter is 53 centimeters. 
And the very first satellite was 58 centimeters across. It also had four antennas that were spreading signals. Those signals were meant for the Earth-based stations. The satellite was assembled in less than a month, and it weighed 84 kilos. Its code name was PS-1, or Elementary Satellite 1. It had two radio transmitters for various frequencies. The size of radio waves were supposed to be monitored at the Baikonur to tell the temperature and the pressure inside the device. Still, there were other purposes too. It was arranged so that any amateur radio operator in the world could receive the signal from that satellite. It was exactly to provide wider recognition of the satellite, not only in scientific field, but worldwide too. There was only one thing left. They needed to launch it into space. Especially because on August 21st, 1957, the long-expected launch of the R-7 rocket happened after it had failed three times before that. The rocket flew almost 6,000 kilometers and then fell down somewhere in the Kamchatka region. The control system is absolutely unique. This scheme of a stationary start was proposed by Sergei Korolev for the first time. Everything on the R-7 was different. It was all new. The rocket was flawless. But the generals insisted it was necessary to send a bomb into space. A trial launch with a nuclear warhead replica on board revealed an issue nobody had ever been expecting. Those warheads that carried thermonuclear bombs got destroyed when they were re-entering the atmosphere. And we couldn't figure out what we needed to work on or change. Two brand new R-7 rockets were ready for launch. But there were no bombs ready for that. Karolyov saw a rare opportunity to launch the satellite earlier. We needed a break to create, develop and present a new warhead. So Korolev used that time to ask to take those rockets to launch the first artificial Earth satellite. The satellite was delivered to Baikonur. The test pilots got to work. The armed missile was about to become a peaceful carrier rocket. The launch was scheduled for October 6th. But Korolev suddenly moved the date. There was information about the Americans also planning their own satellite launch on October 6th. Could we really launch it one day later, to become the second best? So we went to Sergei Korolev with that information. He looked at us and called the KGB. He asked if they knew that the Americans were planning to launch their own satellite on that day. They gave him a very compelling answer. We don't know anything about that. The second paragraph. We don't know if they are not planning a launch on that day. So Korolev decided to shorten the preparation time. So they took some absolute technical risks to have the launch on the 4th. That's why those times were intense. It was all about who would be the first to launch. Autumn days at the Baikonur are always sunny. The sun was shining bright on those final days before the launch. It was more than half a century ago. Ready in 15 minutes. Doctors on duty leave the launching site. October 4th, 1957. 10.28 p.m. Moscow time. It was the moment when the R-7 rocket, with the satellite on board, blasted off. At first we listened to space signals, but when the satellite went west and left radio frequency, we stopped getting any signals at all, and we had to wait for half an hour to start getting them again. Mikhail Rizansky, the chief designer of that institute, was there with us. He immediately dialed that in-doctor phone and asked for Karolyov. Sergei, I congratulate you. And he had tears in his eyes. Soon after that, they could see the telemetering data. The first artificial Earth satellite began moving along the Earth's orbit on its own.
Well, we raised our heads to see the flying spot. Then and only then did we perhaps realize that just some moments ago that satellite was at a launching site under the fairing. And I was working in the instrumental module myself, so I was really close to it. It was only then that we suddenly realized something huge and great had happened. The launch made a resounding splash all across the world. People on different continents were leaving their houses to look at the sky and see the one star moving among others that remained still as usual. The first people in the United States who managed to catch the satellite signals happened to be random amateurs and not military men. Back then the New York Times stated that 90% of talks regarding artificial Earth satellites were happening in America. As it turned out, 100% of deeds actually happened in Russia. The announcer in a newsreel said it was the moon getting to know new things, learning the alphabet. Sputnik. Sputnik. The Russian word Sputnik flew around the world to become known everywhere and be used not only as a technical term, but also as a cultural phenomenon. There were new drinks in East European bars, there were new rock and roll styles in dancing, and even new model haircuts created by barbers. The recent Japanese fashion style is new hair designs, Leica and Sputnik. The first satellite stayed there in orbit for 92 days. By the time it was burned down re-entering the atmosphere, there was the second Soviet device flying around. Careful here, we're all ready for the start. Got it. Go if you are ready. And here goes another satellite again. It is almost like the one that got into space 55 years ago on October 4th, 1957 and opened the space for the people of the planet Earth. It started really nice. It's great. Well done. It's beautiful. And there is the sun. Did you take it, right? <laughs>